Kill Tamers! My name is Nick. Today we'll be deep diving into the Veteran Guardsman Kill Team for Kill Team 2021. This information will be current as of the video upload date. I have some insights which will be helpful for both venerated and new Kill Team players. There are time codes along the bottom of the video and in the video description which will help you skip to any sections relevant to you and your experience levels. For now, let's jump into the team. So, the strengths and weaknesses of the Vet Guard Kill Team. The big strengths here are the high activation count, the primary and secondary objective scoring ability of the team, and the multiple high damage vets present. For the high activation count, you have 14 models, most of which are activating on their own. In total, you have 12 activations minimum, which leaves you a lot of room to maneuver and a lot of ability to present yourself on the board after the enemy has already done all of their activations. For primary and objective scoring, because because we have 14 models, we are able to get onto the objectives and use our multiple models, all of which with 2 APL means 28 APL on objectives. Remember, most objectives in this game can only be scored if you have more APL on it than the opponent, whether that's for ones where you have to activate the objective or ones we have to stand on it, all down to how much APL you have on the objective. It's a lot of APL. For the multiple high damage threats, we have so many models that have really strong damage capabilities. We have crack grenades, frag grenades in the equipment. We have the demolition veteran. We have a sniper. We have gunners. We have the sergeant himself with a plasma pistol and a power sword. There's plenty of damage on this team. While it's hard to keep them alive, they are certainly a threat. As for weaknesses, they're really easy to kill. Lots of important models that you have to keep safe, but if you accidentally expose one of them, things can start to crumble. You have to make sure that you're using obscuring and concealing when you can, as best you can, to ensure you're not taking the kind of damage that's going to one-shot your models. With seven wounds and a five plus save, that's gonna happen often. Additionally, they're awful in melee. All of them usually have bayonets. These bayonets are three attacks. They hit on a four up and they're two, three. It's not gonna do any serious damage to anyone. They're not consistent. You're not gonna one-shot another guardsman with that bayonet, so you're in trouble. And the last weakness is that they have a really high cognitive load. Again, 14 models. You have to really plan out the activations for each of those models in advance and make sure that each of them are doing their job. It doesn't mean that you have to play any less strategically than someone with, say, six models. As for the team itself and all of its operatives, we have 14 models on the team. So you're going to be picking 10 specialists. Four of those models are going to be coming from the ancillary support option, which will give you four troopers. Those support troopers will be coming in instead of the artillery options. So the other 10 are chosen by you. The main operatives that I bring here, the sergeant with the plasma and power weapon, we have the confidence. We have the Sniper, we have the Spotter, we have the Comms, the Demo, Plasma, Melton, Grenade Launcher, Gunners, the Hardened, and that's it. That's all we got. As for the Sergeant with the Plasma Pistol and Power Weapon, this was designed before they realized that they should make you have some options. For example, the Kazarkin that just came out. They have you locked to a Chainsword if you want the Plasma Pistol, or they have you locked to a Bolt Pistol if you want that big Power Weapon. Instead, the Vet Guard get to choose both, so we're going to take both. Your sergeant is an important operative within himself. He is not just a big damage threat. He can do some big damage. You can give him a plus one APL with your comms, who can then have him shoot, charge, and fight. But you're not really going to be doing that a lot because your sergeant has some other important abilities. He can give out orders, which are your central ability for the team. You'll be giving out buffs to your team throughout the game. Those buffs are critical for making the team work, so you don't want to throw at your sergeant before you're ready to. Your confidant is your backup. In case the sergeant does go down when the sergeant dies he allows you to then give out orders until the sergeant dies or confidant group activates with any of your group activation one specialists there's a bunch of different options for how you can use the confidant i personally recommend you go with the bolt gun but i've seen people effectively use the las gun with the hot shot capacitor pack working with the overcharged las guns or you can take the chainsaw and bolt pistol if you're going up against another vet guard team there's some options there then there's the sniper simply a very amazing consistent damage threat cannot pass him up he has a two plus to hit with four attacks 
three, three for the damage profile with mortal wounds three and silence. That means that you can be silent as long as you only dash or don't move. Consistently, you're gonna be doing damage with your sniper. Comboed with the spotter, you can do some really mean things. Don't be fooled thinking that he's useless and into the dark. And into the dark, sure, it's close quarters combat, but the sniper doesn't have any abilities that make him worse the closer you are. He is simply a good damage profile. So even if he's four inches away, the opponent should still be scared of the sniper because it's still a good weapon. The spotter has the only ability in the game, I think, that can knock someone out of conceal with just line of sight. The spotter can point at an opponent and tell that opponent to then briefly change their order from conceal to engage, or then someone within an inch to be able to shoot at that target. This works great with your sniper because both of them can be on conceal and lock down a whole avenue. Of course, the spotter shot because being an engage doesn't make obscuring terrain any less effective. Opponents can play around it, but you can still very much lock down an avenue and often against opponents who aren't using obscuring effectively, you can lock down a whole lane and often kill an operative in the first turn or at least damage someone. The comms is one of the most versatile operatives on this team. He gives an additional APL to a different operative, meaning that your demolition veteran can do one activation combos, like moving, planting, and detonating, or your sergeant can shoot, fight, and charge, or you can even have your plasma gunner who can go and peek out with a dash, shoot, and then move back into cover. There's many different things you can do with the comms. He's a must take. The demolition veteran is the most difficult operative to use well on the team. When researching this video for what other people thought were good and bad operative, it was all of the ones I thought were bad, and then they had the demolition veteran on there, which is interesting because when you think about it, understand him as an 11 inch range, two plus crack grenade with a three inch blast. That blast also goes through walls. It's, it's an amazing weapon. It can often one shot intercessors. The demolition veteran is important. Don't sleep on him. The Plasma, Melta, and Grenade Launcher Gunners are simply good damage profiles. You need to take them. That's about it. The last one, and maybe the one that people often put with the Demolition Veteran in the Don't Take category, is the Hardened Veteran. I slept on him as well during my beginning phases of playing this game, but he plays into your main strategy really well. You're interested in scoring primary objective and secondary objective points. With the Rosary equipment, he can negate an entire one attack dice of damage, and then he also has a 5 up Feel No Pain. This means that he can be incredibly annoying to kill, and he requires two whole attacks to kill, and that means that you can put him on an objective and he will be able to hold it likely for an entire turning point if not more. As for the operatives that I avoid, firstly we have the Bruiser who is just awful. Firstly he's a melee guardsman which as we said the weakness of the team is bad melee. The solution to that is not to use bad melee. The Bruiser has a 3 up 3 attack 3-3 three, three stun baton not really doing anything. Not even gonna kill a guardsman even if you do a crit and a hit which is above average, that's only six damage. A guardsman has seven wounds, not alone against an intercessor who's not gonna care. Then there's the zealot, who's maybe a bit more of a controversial opinion here. This operative is really the greatest bait in this entire kill team. So many people I know have told me to consider this operative and have even argued that the zealot is essential to their vet guard list, but I, I disagree. He's essentially a trooper with group activation one who can reroll his already five up defense dice, which is not great, and maybe get more five ups, it's not gonna save you in the end, and it's definitely worse than the Hardened, who gets a five up to ignore each point of damage, each wound that he takes. And the Hardened has a decent melee weapon, not really important, but certainly better than the Zealot. The Zealot's main ability is that he gets to spend one AP, which is a lot for this ability, to have a three inch aura that gives lethal five plus on just one result to melee or ranged weapons. Now it seems good, right? Having lethal five plus is nice. You can combo that with your gunners maybe, your sniper, but it's really blast bait. This is a three inch aura, meaning that anyone inside of it is probably going to be within two inches, which means that you're going to be clumping all of your important operatives together, which allows the enemy to charge in, throw a frag grenade, and potentially kill your entire back line of important people. Plus, a lethal five plus is not going to really change much, especially when it's only one result. Lethal five plus is nice, uh, but you don't need it. Cool, that's all I need to say about that. The medic operatives.
The Medic is a nice operative to bring, but there's so many other good options that he sort of goes in last. The Hardened Veteran and the Medic switch places often in my list, but for two particular reasons. One, the Medic is quite good in scenarios where you have a lot of shooting going on, but in most objectives in this game, we're not doing a lot of shooting, we're focusing on the primary objective. In narrative play, the Medic can be fantastic. Or in Into the Dark, there's some scenarios where you might want to be focusing on killing before being able to get to the objectives because of the nature of Into the Dark, very close quarters, a lot of melee, you want to be taking out operatives before they get to you, so the medic can help with that. When you do take the medic, he's really great at keeping gunners alive. Just like the zealot, he is blast bait because you need to keep him within three inches of an operative to revive them. Also, you need to be within one inch of an operative in order to heal them. The big downsides to this is that you're giving minus one APL to both the medic and the person that they are reviving. So you wanna be sure that when you do revive an operative, they're in a position in which they can actually do something with that one APL that they have remaining for their next activation. Note, there is a big medic nerf in the recent patch. Medics, when they receive a blast attack, do not immediately get to heal if they don't immediately die. Say they're within two inches of someone who was the target of a blast attack and that person dies, you do not get to revive them until the end of the phase. If at the end of that attack the medic is still alive, then the medic can revive that person. However, if the medic is dead at the end of the entire blast attack, you do not get to revive. For this reason, I think the hardened veteran is often the better choice than the medic for your roster. Then there is that other gunner option, the flamer. It's quite awful. You have a two up to hit, which is good, but it's only four attacks and they only do two, two damage. It's going to torrent off into other enemy operatives, quite like blast, but it's still only two, two damage profile. You're not gonna kill a guardsman just like with the bruiser's baton. It's just not a killing weapon really. It's it's going to do a lot of tick damage. It's not as good as the other weapons. I don't take it even on Into the Dark. It's kind of questionable, even though it does get the lethal five plus that Into the Dark blast weapons and torque weapons get. So the last things that we get are the four troopers. Why do we take the four troopers and not the big cool weapons? Artillery strikes and missiles sound very fun. The reason why we don't take those big guns is that they're pretty mediocre. The weapon profiles themselves aren't that enticing, and you only get to use them twice in the whole game. So in Instead of getting four troopers, which allow you to get plenty of activations off, that's gonna be two activations per turning point if you keep them alive, and they're gonna be sitting on objectives with eight APL. Instead, you're getting two weapons that you only get to use twice one each. These weapons do benefit from vantage point as per the recent balance changes. However, they're still not worth taking. The weapon profiles, for example, the guided missile. It's four attacks, three up, four, six with AP one. You don't get the benefit from take aim on this. You will get vantage point, but it's not going to provide anything that your other gunners are providing currently. And it's not gonna win you the game any faster than if you had four troopers. By only getting to use this once, you're only gonna get to spend command point rerolls on that attack. If you with the attack, that's one of your two weapons used up. Instead, we get to take four troopers, which get to go sit on objectives, they can do tack ops, they can stop enemies from coming to your gunners. They're physically able to block them off by charging them in. You don't have to fight with them, you can just throw them in as bodies. It gives you so much more versatility so that you can use the other good parts of your team to excel and win the game. Speaking of guardsman orders, there are four orders that the guardsman can take and issue throughout the game. Of course, this begins with your sergeant, and then when your sergeant dies, this goes to your confidant. This is a six inch range from whoever has taken command. Your comms can give out orders to your whole team for minus one APL to that comms, so keep that in mind when positioning your operatives. Note that whoever is issuing orders needs to be within six inches of the columns for it to go to your entire team. The best orders here are move, 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 and take aim. As for move, 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 this gives you plus one inch to your normal move, does not affect dash or other things like that, but plus one inch for your normal move is excellent, as it can combo with your free dash from your strategic ploy at the start of the game, so that's three inches, and then your normal moving for six inches. So you're gonna get up essentially through the whole half of the board before the first turning point is done. This will get you onto the objectives and start winning you the game before all of your operatives die. Once you're on the objectives, switching to take aim allows you to 
to re-roll one on your shooting attacks. This allows you to have more consistency with your shooting attacks, and it also allows you to overcharge your LAS guns and your plasma guns with more consistency. By re-rolling the ones, you won't have to worry about the hot as much, though you can re-roll into a one again, and remember you can't re-roll a re-roll by using a command point, so be careful with that. The two bad orders are hold position and fixed bayonets. Fixed bayonets let you fight better, but remember we don't really care about fighting, we're already going to lose in fighting, we really don't care about doing better at it. And hold position lets you die slower while you're in cover. Usually if you're getting shot at in cover, you're going to die anyways no matter what, so you really don't care about this order. As for attack ops, we have the faction attack ops. These are all quite good, except for the first one, boots on the ground. This requires you to have more operatives both on your side of the board and and the enemy side of the board. It requires you to spend a lot of time moving your operatives into places they don't naturally want to be, which is not something that the other attack ops force you to do, and as such, we don't take this one. Stand Fast, on the other hand, which is the faction attack up number two, allows you to gain victory points from sitting on objectives, which is exactly what we want to be doing. If you have two or more objectives controlled by you and more than the opponent, then you will score a victory point, up to two max per round. Stand Fast used to be a bit questionable before the new missions came out because some objective markers did not stay on the ground. However, with the new objectives, all of them have objective markers that stay on the ground, so we will get to benefit from this for the entire game. Glory and Death also supports your strategy of gaining a lot of primary victory points and dying a lot. Glory and Death requires you to have more friendlies dead than the opponent and more victory points than the opponent. This is for the primary victory points, so if you have more primary victory points than the opponent and they're just about to outscore you on attack ops, you will just get two free victory three points for having more friendlies dead than the opponent. This one is typically free. If you're going to win, then you're just going to win more. If you're going to lose, then well, you're probably already going to lose no matter what. As for the classic match play attack ops, these are the ones that came out when the game first came out and that are still being used in some types of play. We have a couple good ones, a couple bad ones. The best attack ups on this list are Seize Ground, Hold the Line, and Central Control. Protect Assets and Plant Banner are more situational, and Damage Limitation is pretty awful. Going from worst to best, Damage Limitation requires you to die less. As Vet Guard, we die a lot and want to die a lot, so we will not be taking this one. Plant Banner is often tricky to score unless the enemy is an elite team, which you can hopefully sneak one operative by one of those six operatives. It can be good, just depends on the map. It's worth playing around with, but it can can be inconsistent if you don't have a game plan for how to score it on the particular map setup that you have. Protect assets can be great to score against other horde teams, but if the enemy has, say, only six operatives, that requires you to kill two operatives on an objective per turning point, you're probably not going to be doing that because the enemy probably only has one on each objective, so it's not going to be consistent. As for seize ground, hold the line, and central control, these are quite easy to score, and they often require you to do things that you're already wanting to do, and so these ones are the ones to consider in this original set of tack ops. As for the more interesting new tack ops, security got a nerf, and so unfortunately less of these are good, but we can still work around them. Seize ground and central control are still quite good, and seize ground, which normally does not work in Into the Dark, they have it replaced with seize access point, which is also relatively good. We are able to get these by putting our operatives in places that they already want to be, and so we should be able to score these with ease. Protect assets again is just as questionable as before, and so just as situational. Hold them back, which replaced hold the line, is significantly worse. Now it requires you to hold enemies from going across the middle line, which they're probably going to be doing by the time you can play it, which is only in the second turning point onward. So you're not going to be able to score this unless you're really winning, which at that point you shouldn't need this tack up. Escort operative requires you to keep an operative alive and in the enemy's deployment zone, which is quite difficult to do, unlike plant banner, which requires you to simply get an operative there. So this one is much worse and not one worth picking. And lastly, secure central line is fine. It's sort of like central control in that you want to be in the center, but it's only the center line. You need to be on that line, which is harder than being just within three inches of the center. But if the map benefits from you taking this, say there's a lot of heavy cover on the center line, then this one is one you could consider taking. As for the usual cards that I take here, for the new pack with pick three, I would go for Glory and Death, Central Control, and Secure Ground or Access Point, depending on if we're in Into the Dark or on Open Board. As for the sort of classic match play mode, we will go for Stand Fast, Glory and Death, Plant Banner, Secure Ground, Hold the Line, and Central Control. Equipment. I bring a chronometer, a rosary, 
and a frag and a crack grenade. The chronometer allows you to re-roll initiative once in the game and we often need initiative as the game goes on so we want to be getting that one in order to gain initiative more frequently. The rosary with the hardened veteran keeps him alive longer to stay on the objective otherwise you can give the rosary to your plasma or your sergeant to keep them alive as well for lots of shooting. Lastly the frag and crack grenades are essential because they are simply good damage weapons. They have three pluses to hit rather than four pluses to hit and their profiles are quite excellent. We take these because the other ones are awful. Hand axes for example make your guardsmen kind of fine at melee though not consistent which in a melee situation you want consistency more than simply good damage. 3-5 isn't an awful damage profile it will kill things greater than a guardsman however you only get three attacks and you still only hit on a four up. The only time to consider hand axes is when fighting other guardsmen to do as a funny joke. Hotshot capacitor packs are simply better damage on your las guns. Oftentimes your las guns are on your troopers and those guys are rarely shooting because they're going and spending their AP on moving, dashing, or securing objectives. As such, you don't really want to waste EP on guys who won't be using their equipment. Some other options that you can consider are the topographical chart. This is quite good on the critical operations mission pack, which is the new pack of cards we got. The topographical chart allows you to resolve two scouting actions rather than just one like you normally would. This means that you can do the free flying dash onto the advantage point and also get barricade on there. It allows you to get that initiative and the first turning point more easily. I would say it's not as good on the regular match play rules where scouting is less significant and less powerful. It is quite fun to stick a sniper on a vantage point with a barricade where he can simply never be killed and can kill everyone else, but that doesn't always happen. The trench shovel can be good on boards which are less balanced. Often on board states where there is a big gap in your starting zone, you can have your sniper and spotter sit there in a trench shovel and hopefully hold down an area that say the map designer did not expect, but it is very situational and requires you to understand what sort of gaps are open. And I would not recommend this unless you're pretty certain that this is a position you want your sniper and spotter to be in the whole game. As for who gets this equipment, I usually put the frag grenade on a trooper, the crack grenade on a hardened veteran, the rosary on the hardened sergeant or the gunner, and the chronometer and maps on the comms who likely will not be dying until the end of the game. Strategic and tactical ploys are next. Into the breach, clear the line, take cover, and overcharge las guns are all quite good and situational. Into the breach will be used every single game at the start of the game and never else. This is the one that will give you a free three inch dash to everyone on your team going towards the enemy objective as long as your friendly operators are within your deployment zone. As such, the moment you use this, they'll all be out of your deployment zone and won't be able to gain any benefit from this being used again. Clear the line is good in situations where you want to be finishing off an opponent who has two health. This is because you can charge a trooper and fight first and then do an immediate two hits of damage. Clear the line lets you retain that one hit in melee as a success, whereas our melee is otherwise inconsistent. It allows us to get that one success to do two free damage no matter what. Only use this when you know you need this and will be able to get the initiative and kill that operative immediately. Take cover is situational as well. I would say don't use it often. It gives you better saves and cover, which oftentimes if you're being shot at, it's not going to help you much. But if you really need it, it is an option. Overcharged las guns is another situational one. This is good in situations where you need to be shooting a lot. It gives you that AP1 a hot on las guns. This can combo with that confidant, or you can use it on your troopers. Combined arms will give you a reroll for all of your shooting dice if someone else has already shot at that target. This works great with the Confidant who can group activate with a group activation one operative. If your confidant shoots at someone, then tell someone else to activate, like the plasma gunner. Then the plasma gunner gets to do all of that re-rolling in addition to re-rolling ones. Use combined arms when you can, as it will guarantee that your shooting is more consistent than it would be otherwise. In-depth atonement is my favorite tactical ploy on this team, and I always save a CP for it for every single turning point. On a ready operative, you can use this tactical ploy when they have died and this allows them to do an activation before they die. Note that this activation has to be done next, otherwise their model will be removed from the board. You do not have to activate them. You can use In-Death Atonement to block, say, an Intercessor from doing a charge fight and then shooting. If you use In-Death Atonement after that fight, they cannot shoot because they're still technically in melee and in engagement range with that dead operative. The model stays on the board, but that model cannot engage in melee because it is technically dead. In-Death Atonement will allow you to get a 
lot more mileage out of your operatives than they would otherwise. Lastly, inspirational leadership allows you to give out additional orders. It is worth considering, but in situations in which you need to have better shooting or better movement, then it can really save you if something comes up. Remember, we only get eight CP in a game. With the new critical operations pack, we do get an extra one to start with, which will be nine CP in a game, but that might get rolled back soon. In a game, I'm typically using into the breach for one, combined arms once or twice, in-depth atonement once or twice, and then some rerolls in there, maybe you clear the line. Let's start talking about combos. First up is the comms and demo combo. With our first APL, we'll be moving our demolition veteran out seven inches with our six inch normal move and our plus one inch from the move, move, move guardsman order that we've hopefully already given. Then with our second APL, we will plant the mine one inch away from the demolition veteran, and then we will get a free dash three inches away from where we were. This is gonna mean that we are four inches away from where the mine is. Note that we're looking to get this mine within three inches of any enemy operatives that we can, including through heavy cover, except in Into the Dark where we can't measure through walls. And then with our third APL, which we got from the comms, we will be able to detonate the mine. Again, this is a three inch blast. We will be outside of that three inch blast, so we will not be blowing ourselves up, and we'll be doing a lot of damage that the opponent did not expect. This results in a total of 11 inches of threat range away from your demolition veteran when he has plus one APL. As for the sniper and spotter, remember that whoever is shooting at the target does need to have full cover lines to the target. However, they'll be flipped from concealed to engage, so you will not have to worry about that part of the cover system. You will have to worry about the enemy operative being obscured. So you can position your spotter in such a way that you only see part of the enemy model, and then you get to have your spotter one inch away from whoever is actually shooting at that target, who can hopefully hopefully then actually see the full base of that model or at least be able to draw sufficient cover lines to that model and make the shot. Here's an example of the spotter just seeing the hands of a gene sealer, whereas the sniper can truly make the shot. This can keep your spotter safe in scenarios where otherwise he might need to be more exposed. And this will ensure that your sniper and spotter team aren't at threat of being blasted as easily. The next big combo that we're gonna be talking about is the objective marker leaping strategy. This is less effective in critical operations where we do not have an objective that requires you to take and hold an object, but in a lot of narrative missions and in the old mission packs, we have a lot of these, and so this can be beneficial. A group activation two trooper can get within one inch of a marker and pick it up, then can immediately drop it one inch away from the trooper. This will be about three inches of movement of the marker from its original spot. At this point, you can then group activate an operative, which is within one inch of that trooper's marker that he just dropped, pick it up and run away. This will get you a lot of movement out of an objective where you otherwise would have to wait a whole turn to be able to move that objective marker. If your first trooper is picking up and dropping the marker, and then your second is also picking up and dropping the marker. This is about six inches of movement. Lastly, and I don't really want to call this a combo, but it kind of is, is intentional friendly fire. You can blow up your friends with the demolition veteran if you really need to. This might sound ridiculous at first, but you can use this to deny enemies seeking destroy attack ops that require enemy operatives to kill your operatives, and you can use it to guarantee faction attack op three against horde teams. If you have more guys alive than the opponent because you've been doing so well, but you need that tac op score for a tournament you can blow up your own guys to ensure you get faction tac op three and you win the game you can also trade with intentional friendly fire remember that we have 14 operatives and enemies might not have that many so we need to be doing a lot of trading with the demolition veteran we can plant the mine near a friendly and still detonate it enemies might not expect you to plant mines near friendlies but remember our troopers are expendable if we're trading an assault intercessor for a trooper that's a win for us don't be afraid to blow up your own guys if it means that you might win the game. All of this together results in a very unique playstyle. We will be out activating the opponent at every stage of the game if we can, and we'll be throwing away this APL, these operatives, as strategically as possible, whether that's for trading for objective points or trading enemy operatives. Ultimately, we want to win the game before all of our operatives die or before the enemy has a chance to outscore us. With this playstyle in mind, here are some examples of what you can do through turning point one, two, three, and four. In turning point 
2.1 when we're deploying, we want to make sure that we're keeping awareness of enemy blast threats. If an enemy has a grenade launcher that has infinite range, it can get onto a vantage point and target us in the first turning point. Or if they have things that can negate obscuring, like the auspex and the intercessors, then we want to make sure that we're keeping our operatives not too bunched up. Obviously, with how many guys we have, we cannot keep them all two inches away from each other, but we can group them up into groups of two to prevent ourselves from being blasted off the board before we have a chance to do anything. We want all of our gunners, if possible, to be on engage in obscuring. If that is not possible, then prioritize your grenade launcher and your plasma gun, and then leave your melta on concealing to be able to do something in the second turning point. Your sniper and spotter should be together in cover, holding down a lane or getting ready to move somewhere where they can wait for the rest of the game. The comms, sergeant, and demo should stick together so that the comms can give out APL to the demo or the sergeant and can also then give out orders to the whole team through the sergeant. All your troopers and your hardened veterans should be sitting there getting ready to get on to an objective. Keep in mind that all of our operatives will get a free three inch dash at the strategic ploy phase of the game with one of our strategic ploys, so plan for that. You do not need to have your operatives in cover, you just need to have them ready to move three inches into cover. As for scouting, we prefer two to one to three, meaning we prefer the change in order scouting option to the place of barricade scouting option to the free dash scouting option. We never really want to take the free dash scouting option because we already get a free dash on our strategic ploy. As for our turning one strategic ploys, we will always be doing move, 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 and we'll be giving out our guardsman order for plus one inch to move through move, move, move. The activations that we do during turning point one should all be setting up for turning point two. We want to delay as much as possible to maybe get a shot off with our engaged gunners or with our sniper and spotter combo. We can idle a lot of our operatives. We don't need to move all of them up initially. We can try and get our troopers and hardens on the objective, but we can keep a lot of our operatives back waiting to trade. If your demolition veteran does not have any enemies within 11 inches at the start of the turn, you can activate your demolition veteran and have him wait so that the comms can give him a buff when he's already been activated. This plus one APL will last until the next activation, which will be in the second turning point, meaning that your comms can give out two AP buffs essentially in the second turning point. But if your demolition veteran does have a target in the first turning point that is within 11 inches, then absolutely go for it. Score as many points as you can in the first turning point as they will really help us later on in the game. Turning point two is about using all of that setup that we just did to be able to execute as much of our game plan as possible. This will mean shooting as many enemy operatives as we can and securing as many objectives as possible. Our strategic ploys will look like guardsmen take aim and then we'll likely be using in-depth atonement and combined arms and some rerolls during this phase because we're focused a lot on killing. We're capitalizing on having most of our models alive, if not hopefully all of them, and so we want to use these operatives as much as possible so the enemy can't kill them all. If we're being conservative and only throwing out one or two operatives, those ones are certainly gonna die. Turning point three is where things begin to get scary for us. We've just thrown all of our threats out into the open. We've hopefully killed a lot of enemy threats, but now the enemy has a chance to retaliate against our big attack. They've probably reached most of the objectives and melee teams will be charging at us, whereas shooting teams will now be shooting back at us. Our model count is probably beginning to run low and we're now on the back foot. We want to be scaring objectives primarily and then if we have the opportunity to, doing some damage. However, the only damage that we should be doing here are ones that are going to secure us victory points either now or in turning point four. This means focusing on enemies that are on objectives or near them. Our sergeant is probably going to be able to do his big damage move during turning point three or four and will likely die at this stage. In turning point four, we are no longer looking to trade except if it guarantees that we're getting victory points. All of our APL should hopefully be sitting towards objectives or securing tack ops. In-depth atonement is going to be critical here for ensuring that maybe the one or two gunners that are still alive are actually going to be able to do anything during this phase. If you haven't won by turning point four, then unfortunately things might be a bit tricky during this turning point. And that's it! Thank you so much for watching my first kill team video on the veteran guardsman kill team. If you want to see more of my minis over on the right side, you can see my uh, Instagram handle where I have all my mini sure pictures over there. Big credits to the London Wargaming Guild, particularly Nixie and Jason, who are some great vet guard players over in the UK. Can You Roll a Crit is also a great YouTuber who gave me a lot of inspiration when making this video. I has some great thoughts on the game and I recommend checking him out. The Dice Dojo in Chicago is my primary place of playing and I really want to thank them for giving me a place to take a lot of these photos and consider this game. And lastly, I want to thank my partner for editing this video. I really, really appreciate that. And if you like this video, video, maybe I'll make some more. Until next time, 
outro, I guess. I don't know. <laughs>